the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. After months of negotiation overseen by a federal judge, representatives of the city of Cincinnati and Hamilton County announced a compromise agreement to restructure the management of the Metropolitan Sewer District. MSD was created in 1968 when 24 local sewer districts in Hamilton County consolidated into a single system and signed a 40-year agreement. The county assumed ownership of the entire system with the authority to set policy and rates, approve budgets, and issue debt. The city of Cincinnati agreed to operate the system on a day-by-day -day basis. Not only will this agreement reach its end next year, but in recent years, friction between the owner and the operator have become increasingly pronounced due to unhappiness over rate increases, partially driven by the need to spend $3 billion to modernize the system. The proposed restructure includes a new five-member board that will oversee the day-to-day -day operations. Three members will be appointed by the county, two by the city. The board will have the authority to hire and fire the top two MSD administrators. MSD employees will become county employees, but will continue to pay into the city retirement system, an important but complicated concession uh, that will help keep the city retirement fund solvent. Reaction has been varied. Pair just wants the rates to go up slower and the sewers to get fixed and running. We need time with the public's engagement on an agreement that is 45 years long. None of us will be in power when this agreement comes due. And so it's important for us not to just be excited about the fact that we've got individuals who agree today but what happens five years from now, 10 years from now, when we have a different body that disagrees? I think this does not help the rate pair at all. And if anything, it's replacing the current dysfunction we have with a new type of dysfunction with this oversight board. It's almost dysfunction 2.0. I'm joined now by Todd Portoon, the president of the Hamilton County uh, Board of Commissioners, and Wendell Young, a member of the Cincinnati City Council. Both of you, welcome to Newsmakers. Welcome back in both cases. Yeah, thanks. Nice, Dan. Um, Good to be here. Todd, one of the <coughs> issues, and Yvette Simpson was hinting at this, was after months of negotiation, there is a certain sense that this needs to be uh, approved quickly. Why is there speed required here? What, what's ticking on this? Well, what's ticking is the ticking time bomb of MSD needing more money to fuel the, the ability, fuel the engine of meeting the demands of the consent decree. We're required basically to build new projects every year that are the equivalent of building a new stadium every year. Uh, in terms of cost, over $200 million a year, we've got to raise new. So we've got to go to the bond market to issue bonds to meet the obligations under the federal decree. In order to do that, part of that is an annual statement that the county issues relative to our obligations, our, our debt, um, whether things are in conflict. And the bond market has been watching this issue and this conflict between the city and the county for a long time. Since uh, we last had an issue and went to the market on MSD bonds, there's been all sorts of statements made coming out of the city about taking their assets out of MSD, setting up their own sewer system. We've been in litigation with the city. The market is very, very nervous. And our statement that we issued that the bonds that we're going to go to the market on in the coming year is based on is due August the 15th. So we've got, and, and that's a, a firm deadline, Dan, we can't extend that deadline on that statement. So we've got to have this, this conflict, or at least a statement about whether the conflict is resolved by that date, or else it's going to affect the cost of, of bonds dramatically. It will affect our bond rating, uh, probably the cities as well. As well. Um, it's, going to, it's going to affect the, the cost of the uh, debt service on the bonds and all those things. So that's well, why the deadline. Wendell, August 15th is 10 days away. Mm -hmm. One of the arguments has been that there isn't enough time for people who weren't involved in the negotiations, and you were not directly involved, uh, to review this. What do you say, recognizing that there is this August 15th deadline staring in the face? Well, I have several things to say, but the first thing I want to say, and I want to be very clear, there's no conflict between Todd Portin and Wendell Young. We get along quite well. Secondly, I, I want to be very clear that I really appreciate the work that the commissioners and 
uh, uh, Mayor Cranley and, and Vice Mayor David Mann have put into doing this. However, this is a huge undertaking. And they had months to sit down and work together and overcome their differences and come to something that they think is a good agreement. And it may be a good agreement. I don't know. And because I don't know, I'm not able to support it right now. There are several things I have questions about. But the most important thing is there needs to be a real opportunity for ratepayers to weigh in on whether this is a good deal in their opinion. And I think that that's the responsible thing to do. I understand the deadline that Todd is looking at, but for me, I can't pay attention to that. This is an asset that we don't even know the value of. I don't know if it's worth $200 million, $300 million, $400 million. I don't know that the city is properly compensated for the asset. I don't know uh, how the, this, this thing will actually operate. We talk about five commissioners, but we don't know what kind of qualifications they'll need to have. Uh, they won't be responsible to the ratepayers. We have lots of questions that need to be answered, but the most important piece of this is, I think before I can vote, I need to know how the public feels about this, and that's going to take more than 10 days. Well, listen, Dan, we all rail against the process. None of us like the fact that, that we were under this gag order by the federal judge. It, it's one of the most um, unsettling things about the whole process. But it, it was And I have to say, I've had guests on the show who were involved in those negotiations who could not talk, and I recognize that. There was no sense but in trying they, to push they, they, they could not talk to you. It did not mean we could not talk to each other. The downside of what happened is the people, uh, the mayor and the vice mayor, did not talk, as far as I know, to members of council about what they were doing. So they could have shared that with us. They did not. And that also is part of the problem. All the commissioners were at the table. So they had the opportunity to know full well, well what was going on. Well, technically, weren't two of the commissioners at the table. Well, no, all three were, well, all were, three were, were there no. throughout. But, you know, I hear what Wendell is saying, and, and <coughs> he's right. This isn't a, a personal thing between the two of us. But the judge set up what the process was. Um, he dictated that the city would be represented by the mayor and the vice mayor, uh, the county by all three commissioners. Um, but uh, you know, we're missing the important point here, which is uh, the focus should be on what has been negotiated. And what has been negotiated is a very good deal. It puts an end to the dysfunction at MSD. It puts an end to the litigation that has gone on for far too long between the city and the county and is costing untold millions of dollars but and costing me, rate payers. Let me jump in. I, 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 and, I'm, and not, I'm not sure it puts an end to the dysfunction. If, if you listen to Monzel when he spoke. What he said was dysfunction <laughs> 2.0, and though that's laughable in a way. Well, it is. But, it is, but, Wendell, but, very laughable. But, but the reality is he's correct, because we don't know whether that's going to end the dysfunction. One thing, if we've learned nothing else, we should have learned that a 45-year marriage probably is not a good idea. Even within this, within that whole time frame, there's no periodic review. There, there's no opportunity to, to assess how well this is or is not working, and there's no talk of an exit plan if it does not. So I, again, I say this needs a lot more vetting than it currently has. Get the, the board that's going to be set up, the five-person board, right. three appointed by county, two by the city, right. who's going to be on that board? What kind of people are going to be on that board? Well, it's going to be selected by both the city council and the county commission. But would these be these technocrats or these um, political appointees or? Dan, you know? they're, they're going to be subject to the county's rules and policies. We have a very lengthy uh, board appointee policy at the county um, where everyone who uh, is interested in serving on a board. They have to fill out this lengthy questionnaire. It, it gets into interest, it gets into backgrounds, it gets into whether they're affiliated uh, in terms of they've worked on people's political campaigns or not, if they've given money to campaigns. Um, it allows for a very deep dive into who the individuals are. Um, but there, there were no specific things put into the, the document. And I think that's a good thing because it allows for the city and it allows for the county. When Dan, the, I'm, I'm if gonna, I could finish, please, well, Wendell, okay. you've me twice We only got here. a couple of minutes. <laughs> well, and you've talked for most of the you've no, talked no, no, for no, most no. Of the Go ahead, just finish up real quick. In, in fairness, please, you know, um, 
it, and you've thrown me off track, which Good. is probably what you wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what this whole thing is, is, is diverting attention from no, the no, focus the on, what is a good, panel, right. on, on what is a very good deal, a very hard-fought negotiation, a very comprehensive end to the dysfunction between the city and the county. And on this five-member board, um, we, th there is no specific criteria put in there because that allows for the city and the county to ascertain who is absolutely the best person without regard to, oh, if you don't have this single criteria, you're disqualified okay. from serving on the board. Wendell, on this appointment of the board, and I don't want to move on to something else, sure. but um, there are other boards that are jointly appointed by county and city, sorta I'm thinking about for one. Sort of a good example. Is that? Uh, well, again, I mean, you have issues there. I mean, we have issues with the sorta board. The problem simply is, in my opinion, and I'm going to say that, let's just say that uh, this would work really well if Todd Portun, Denise Streethaus, Chris Monzel are going to be there forever. They won't. And so going forward, what happens? Now Todd talks about the qualifications he envisions. They're not in the paperwork I've seen. What we have to worry about is a few things. One, the city really doesn't have a voice in this. You got five people who work together. It's kind of easy to pressure at least one person to go along with you. The other problem you have is because you don't know what the qualifications are going to be, you could end up with cronyism. You could end up with a number of problems in that five-member commission. Let me jump don't to another. Let me just say one thing, okay, and I'll shut quick. up on this. These people are not responsible to the ratepayers, and so that also is an issue. But go ahead. But we have other systems where that's it's not direct responsibility. Yeah, and I so. yeah, and I disagree that they're not responsible to the ratepayers, Wendell. <laughs> I, I mean, tried. With, with respect to any board that okay. exists, they're, they're appointed by the elected officials. One of the and really one of the interesting things about this agreement <clears throat> is that the employees of MSD will become employees of the county, but right. their retirement, according to the agreement, will go to the city to keep that retirement fund solvent right. but that has right. to be approved by the state legislature that's a tricky thing Wendell what what happens if this doesn't get approval we're back where we started and and I am not certain that the legislature will agree to that it's it's hard for me to fathom that the legislature will care so much about what's going on in Cincinnati that they would permit county employees to pay into a city retirement system. This is a huge issue for us and the county. I don't believe it's a huge issue at the state level. I don't see that they believe that they will see this as, quote, their issue. But it's central to whether this will work. It's one of the reasons I think that announcing this as a, quote, done deal is a bit premature. Todd? Well, it, it's not uncommon for the legislature to take up matters like this that are unique to individual jurisdictions statewide, especially something that is as big and important as the resolution of this decades-long problem is. But on that specific point, uh, there's two things that are uh, very important to point out. Number one is, it was important to all of us, and we committed before we ever even entered into the negotiations, that the historic settlement that the city reached on the entire Cincinnati retirement system would be preserved and would not be undermined at all by any outcome of the negotiation. Right. That's why it's critically important that current employees, future employees, everybody pays into the system. Second though, and this is why it's of, of interest to the state, there are periodic reviews on whether the entire CRS system can then be moved into the Ohio public employees retirement system, which everyone acknowledges is a more solvent, more stable system. And so the, the end goal here is to get CRS But the moved Cincinnati into system Oakland. has to get to the point where it can happen. It, it does, and, and, it's, and, not, it's, not and it's, not, it's not there now, and it won't get there it, without talk, everybody paying into CRS. Have you been t in communication with um, legislative leaders? All of us have been in touch okay. with legislative leaders, yes, and, and, and ongoing. And what ongoing. does your gut tell you? Uh, my gut tells me that th by the end of the day, when they're fully informed on how good this is, how much this puts an end to this function, how good this will be in streamlining the process and being able to reduce cost and be good for ratepayers, and how it will benefit the public employee's retirement, both at CRS and then ultimately in OPERS, OPERS, that they will support this. One final thing, sure. Wendell. Do you have a big pile of papers with a formal proposal 
on your desk that you're working your way through? I do. I don't call it big. Okay. It's, it's big in the sense that there are a lot of unanswered questions, which would actually increase the size of the paperwork. Okay. But there's a lot more work to be done. And again, the public needs an opportunity to weigh in on this. Well, thank you both uh, for your work and for being here this morning. And. Um, interesting issues. I'm really, Dan, I'm and really on, interested. Dan, on, on, on the public weighing in, we've had several public forums, uh, public hearing, and there is another public hearing that is scheduled for this Monday, August the 2nd, 7th rather, not the 2nd, August 7th, at the MSD facility at uh, 225 West Galbraith Road. Dan, that's the, good, but not good the enough. There need to be several of these, and they need to be in the communities where people are, okay. not at some remote location that many people can't even That's find. That's as central as you can get, Wendell. Okay, it's we convenient go. to all. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> After the break, the reasons behind the decision by the public library to close a major portion of the downtown branch. At its June meeting, the Board of Trustees of the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County approved the closing of the North Building of the downtown branch of the Public Library, the 156,000 square foot facility, which occupies most of a block of prime real estate in the Central Business District, was opened just 20 years ago and cost over $39 million to build. The North Building is the home of the Children's Library on the first floor, the Newspaper Research Area on the second floor, the Maker Space, the Teen Center, as well as the library's administrative offices on the third floor. To discuss the reasons behind this decision and the implications for the library, I am joined now by Kim Fender, who has served as the director of the Public Library of Cincinnati uh, since 1999, and Molly DeFossi, the fiscal officer of the Public Library. Ms. DeFossi is responsible for all aspects of the library's finances. <laughs> Kim, welcome back. Molly, welcome to, to Newsmakers. Um, Kim, th this decision was made apparently at the June meeting. Why didn't the library announce this? I mean, this sort of gotten, you, you kind of got pushed out here. What, why didn't you just come out and, and talk about this? Well, actually, this is part of a larger facilities plan that was approved almost a year ago. So it was the only decision made at June was to move forward with moving the four public departments, which the new newspaper research department is not part of that anymore. Um, it's already in the South Building. Oh, it's already in the yeah. South Building. Yeah. I guess I haven't been there for a while. It's a problem of having run. OK, go ahead. So um, to move those four public departments over into the South Building and then uh, have the North Building just be staff only for the the time being. So uh, we really didn't feel that uh, it was a huge impact on the public because no services are being cut at this time. No decision to sell the building has been made. So uh, as we were opening new areas in the South Building, certainly that would have been the announcement we would have made. Molly, uh, this was part of a much larger plan, as I understand, yes. $54 million mm -hmm. facilities plan that relates not just to the downtown library, but to the entire system. Correct. Um, what's involved in that, and and how does the decision that to shut down this facility relate to helping you meet those other needs? Well, the first thing would be to get the funding from selling the building. The sale of the building would help us get to that $54 million. Um, there's $18 million worth of maintenance work at all the branches, a, a little bit at Maine. There's, we have several rental facilities that we would like to build newer facilities for those. Um, some larger renovation work, we need to replace elevators at the main library, um, a bunch of mechanical work and roof work that needs to be done. But the bulk of it is, is really that branch maintenance work that hasn't been done for a long period of time carpeting, a lot of it's uh, renovation type work. Mm -hmm. We've gotten to the point where we've done most of our new roofs and new mechanical units, but there's just every day there's a new thing that needs to be done. Uh, Kim, how does the changing structure of libraries, their role in society, the digitization of materials, how does that play into this, and or does it play into this? 
I think it does in that the main library when it was originally built was much more of a reference center. So its focus was on nonfiction, uh, periodicals for that type of research, and much of that work is being done online now. So we've added things like the makerspace, a teen area, a homework center that took the place of really three of the departments that were in the North Building when it was originally built. Um, and of course that work has been distributed across all the branches because with the online resources, it doesn't matter where you are. You can be at home, at work, in your classroom, or at one of our branches and have access to the same research materials that you used to have to come downtown for. So by um, consolidating this into one space, we're making a much more effective use of the dollars and space that we have and investing more in the branches across our system. Molly didn't mention the uh, three branches that we have that are still not handicapped accessible, mm -hmm. for example, okay. uh, Madisonville, Price Hill, and Walnut Hill. So, um, and those are things that uh, need and to be that done. plan, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to be able to come into the building. Molly, what, how does this relate to the continuing cuts of state money that come to the local library. Mm -hmm. You had to, the library had to go out for a local levy for Correct. the first time. Correct. Uh, the library had never had to do that. This library had not had mm -hmm. to do that before. That's Got a huge support. Right. But how does that state funding? What's it look like going forward? Well, Kim, Kim can probably speak to this a little bit more because she spent a lot of time over the last few months up in Columbus working on that. But it's pr it's pretty much staying flat um, as of for the next two years, uh, where it's been there's been a few little tweaks. But I think where. Uh, for the next year or two, we can estimate the same that we've gotten this year. But in general, our funding hasn't changed since about 2000. We've been pretty much the exact same dollar amount. All the levy did was replace what we lost at the state. Because the state made those huge yes, cuts. Yes, yes. And at the same time, our use of the library has increased by 60 percent. In fact, in 2016 was our busiest year ever at 21.2 million items borrowed and that made us the second busiest library in the country. What do you think is driving that <laughs> increased use? Um, uh, given I, the fact that I can now get things online. Well, a lot of those things online are available for you to borrow from us instead of having to pay for them. So that digital use is our fastest growing area of use. Okay. Um, but we're also really working hard to get new materials as quickly as you can get them from a bookstore. Um, then we're trying to make it really convenient and easy for people to use it so you can sign up for services like Hot Authors or Hot Tickets and get new books automatically when they come in. And we're really seeing a, a good response to those services. I think one of the spaces in that North Building, and maybe you know, I just love the library, uh, the, the, the reading microfilm newspapers. <laughs> yeah, right. Because uh, <laughs> that's what I mentioned, because that's what I used all the time. But the, one of the areas that was really loved and was a great space is the children's area on that first floor. Uh -huh. What happens to that? Where, is it still there in the North Wing? Is, uh, it, or has it already been moved to south? It has not yet been moved. Um, we have some work we need to do to the south building to make that space ready. But what we'd like to see happen is for that children's area to be near the popular library right there on the first floor because what we're finding is it's not convenient for families to come and use the library. They either have to choose to go to the children's department over in the north building or to the popular library over in the south building and if they want to do both they have to go up across the bridge and down or outside and around the block. Okay, so you're trying to combine spaces. Right. Are you going to be able to fit everything into the South Building or are you going to have to at some point, whether it's for administrative offices or some function, uh, library function, going to have to have some other space downtown? Well, not necessarily downtown. An operations center is part of the $54 million plan. Um, a lot of our operations that are done at the main library don't need to be downtown. Our receiving department, uh, the material sorting, a, a lot of those items don't need to be downtown. So does that mean when I return a book? You still I, return I, it where you return it. Anywhere. Uh, anywhere. Anywhere. But it will go to a different place rather than downtown, is that what you're saying? Uh, it might. It depends on if you return it downtown and it's staying downtown, then it will never leave downtown. But if you're returning it and it's going to fill another hold or it's part of our floating collection, then it would be sorted through and our And what own. about new books coming in that have to be cataloged? Yeah, they would go to the new operations center instead. Okay. And then be distributed out to all the locations. Now we do that at Maine and distribute it to all the locations except Maine because it's right there. So it's, it's really a, a minimal change. 
I, I've got less than a minute left, but <laughs> I understand that you're working with 3CDC to mm -hmm. determine what the future of that building and site is. Is that correct? And what are you hoping for out of that? Well, we have a what's called a pre-development services agreement with 3CDC, which is being done at no cost unless it moves to the development stage. There's been some misunderstanding about that. Um, and what we hope to get out of that is some indication of whether or not the idea of selling the building is even practical, if there's any interest in that site, any reuse of the building, or if we should make other plans. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as you know, everybody goes to the library, yep. so <laughs> people are concerned about this. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet a local family who recently returned from a trip to Lebanon working in Syrian refugee camps. Have a good week.